Okay, we are recording. Sam, how are you doing today? I'm good, mate. I'm very good. I've not had as much sleep as I would like, but that is life as a parent. <laughs> uh, young ones? Uh, yeah, just the one. I've got a two-year-old daughter. Um, but it was it's actually my own fault. I was started watching... Um, oh, is it called... I've never forgotten what it's called. Is it called Squid Game on Netflix? Oh, someone was literally telling me about this yesterday, saying yeah. it's incredible. So the first episode is so bizarre. You're kind of like, it, I think it depends what format you watch it. And you can watch it because it's a Korean show, I think. And you can watch it um, in like their native language with English sub- subtitles. Or you can watch it like dubbed with English audio. And obviously that's a bit kind of stereo. And it takes you out of the story a wee bit, but I, I opted to not read and just listen. Yeah, so the first episode t- took me a wee minute to get used to, but then I think I ended up watching like five episodes back to back last night. So it's my own fault. Right. I tried, to, I tried to blame it on my kids, but it's actually... I was just trying to think, how in <laughs> any way, shape or form is that your child's fault? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, because I had to get up early with her. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So my had immediate you, Had thought, you gone to bed at a sensible time, it would have been fine, right? Basically, it's my fault. But that's uh, that's a nice little synopsis of my approach to life right there, is uh, I'll make a mistake and then blame someone else. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, looking back um, over the last uh, sort of 17, 18 months, Sam, yeah. Um, Obviously, we're, we're recording this at the, the end of September and, you know, we're currently in, you know, what appears to be a more, a better place than where we was this time last year. Um, I just wondered how, you know, just looking back briefly on, on lockdown, like how that affected you personally uh, and creatively? Um, yeah, well, personally, I guess it was... Um... It's such a it's such a wild swinging uh, pendulum on the spectrum of good to bad. I think that the uh, the, the overall thing I'd, I I kind of go with the midpoint where it was. Well, my my wife Caitlin works in the hospital. She's a nurse, so it was quite a kind of a uh, immediate effect to our sort of family life because she was on uh, maternity leave and wasn't fully qualified yet, but kind of had a gun to the head scenario where it was like, you need to come in and work for the NHS full time now, or don't at all ever again type of, type of thing. So we kind of had to change the whole dynamic and I became stay at home dad, rather than the guy who was obviously, a, a, we, were, we haven't actually been touring that much because we were at home making a record the last, well, the two years leading up before the pandemic. Um, but that was still a lot of time away from home long hours in the studio and stuff so we kind of flipped that whole dynamic but then I loved it because I got to spend time with my daughter that I thought I wasn't really going to have in a consistent way um but then on the on the sort of um creative side that was the question wasn't it personally yeah. and creatively um on the creative side I kind of did what I've always done since I was a wee boy which is just when something is difficult for me to process or relate to or emotionally deal with. I just, I kind of channel it into being creative. And that that's sort of why I got into music in the first place, I think. Um, that's what it sort of means to me rather than this sort of um, identity tag of like coolness or something like that. It's sure. more of an emotional connection for me. And so I brought stuff home from our studio And just in my spare time between looking after Sadie or on Caitlin's days off, I would then kind of go into the, it was was actually uh, my daughter's spare room. I ended up making an album, a full album, Um, kind of by mistake, because I I, I, I reached out to someone that I was meant to be going to America. I was meant to be going to California to write a song with someone I'd worked with before. And so at the beginning of lockdown, kind of like everyone else, I was like, ah, this will be like a couple of months tops, but I'll reach out to this guy and see if we're still going to do it or if we could do it remotely because I'd heard people had started to do that in the first week or two. And then all of his stuff had been cancelled. So the two of us basically just went, that was quite good. Will we do another one? Will we do another one? And in the first six weeks of lockdown, I kind of ended up with a full record. 
by mistake, but I love it. Sorry, that's quite a lot. That was quite a long. No, answer. no, no, at all, not at all. Because uh, I really like how you answered that because it wasn't a knee jerk thing of like, right, I've got this time, I've got to make it can. It, you know, I, I no. like it when things sort of happen like that. That's it's been a real kind of mixture of of answers to this question when I've asked. Um, you know, previous guests and and some people said like the minute I knew that I wasn't going to be touring, I was going to just throw myself head into writing a record, and it mm. just weren't happening. Like I, I wanted it to because the time oh, was there, yeah. but it just weren't yeah. happening. Uh, and I, you know, the, the fact that yeah, it was a happy accident—that's glorious, man. Well, I do feel really, really lucky because we're, we're you know we're starting to do interviews and talk, basically talk about myself now to to people, <laughs> and I do my overall overriding fe feeling is total I mean I feel a little bit guilty about it if anything because some bands or other artists were forced into getting kind of a more mainstream job or like a more normal job or you know that's the easiest way to kind of call it that um and then maybe couldn't afford to keep going but we I've just been so lucky that I've been doing it for so long I've got some toys and things like that that I can play with and uh, people around me that were kind of helping me to to, to, to get it done um i think it was more to keep me distracted because we, we had an album come out in the january of 2020 and it was a huge huge lead into it where I, I mean like i was producing it did the artwork i mean it was like i did too much i took on too much of a workload and uh basically before it came out I had a bit of a wobble about it all as well and kind of wasn't really in a good place um so the the timing of the pandemic was kind of good for me selfishly. Um, I don't. I, I always try and find the positive out of every situation. This is obviously sure. a bit an extreme one, but I think the people around me and my management and stuff like that were thinking, right? How do we keep this guy creatively ticking over so that he doesn't go back to where he was a few months ago? Because I just was in the sort of trenches of. Um, by the way, this is all super first world problems. <laughs> These are. <laughs> we're, 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 talk like, we're talking about you today mate i know i know but these aren't like real life struggles it was just in my little bubble they were because i'd been doing i've been making music and chasing the impossible dream whatever uh, whatever that i don't even know what the end goal is uh, from being in this particular band but i just get so swept up in it and too involved that i just lost track of why i was even doing it i think so that so, so the idea of then been locked back in a bedroom with very kind of minimal gear um, and quite a lot of obstacles like the guy I was working with Jack Knife Lee a producer he was based in LA so it was an eight-hour time difference plus a one-year-old to look after at the time so I was working I think I started maybe at like eight nine o'clock at night when she was kind of settled and then I'd work to like maybe three, four in the morning or something like that. And then I'd get up at seven with the kid again and do it all over again. <laughs> That's some serious plates. I, I, I was actually annoyed. Everyone was learning how to like make bread and like <laughs> going on, you know, doing exercise. And I was like, that looks quite good. Why am I doing this? Or, or going through like m movie catalogs and TV shows that they wanted to watch and reading books. And I was a uh, problem solving an album that I didn't know was an album at the time, but with Jack Knife Lee though, with Jack Knife Lee, but I mean, that's, say, cool. that's another example of this was all self inflicted, and I'm trying to blame everybody else again. That's my go to move, but yeah, with Jack Knife Lee, yeah, what a producer he is, mate. Man, he's more. Do you know he's become more than a producer to me? He's like uh, a mentor or like a kind of um, a fag, a father figure within creative thinking um and ultimately just a good mate because it was if it had been anyone else that i was just kind of scheduled in to go and write with um it would never have happened it was just you know i had this number i could text them on a on a, a level to be like do you fancy this and i think if it'd been anyone else we wouldn't have got as much material written because there wasn't that initial hurdle of like, oh, talking about the pandemic all the time, we sure. kind of went straight back because I've worked with him before. We've done another full length album called GLA in 2015 with him, came out in 2016. And then he'd helped us pull together some of this, the last finishing touches on another album. We've got Great Divide. 
and they all the songs we did with him all ended up being the the only singles off that record. So we knew it was like in a it was like an instant creative spark we had. So to have someone like that to as my safety net, yeah, is so so spoiled. A- anyone listening who doesn't know who he is, he works with like U two, REM, The Killers, bands that fill stadiums. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why he continues to want to work with us, but I, I, it must just be uh, we've got that sort of friendship uh, level thing and, happening. And if I'm right, he he was in his own band as well back in the day, wasn't he? He was, uh, yeah. He, band he, Compulsion. Compulsion, yeah. yeah. And and for listening to this podcast, you get a chance to listen to Mal Monarchy, the single by Compulsion. Fuck me, that's a that's a <laughs> stonker of a record that is go give go give that one a whirl right well look we're talking records um today sam and for track one i'm going to ask you please to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro i'm glad i've got my own answers in front of me here by mistake uh, i'm usually not this organized i couldn't i mean you can have honourable mentions because when I've asked you a question for your home, uh, your hometown, fuck me, you, you sent me over about ten. So you can have some honourable mentions, man. <laughs> well, for, for for the question you've asked now, I've picked the uh, U two where the streets have no name. There is another song there, Arctic Monkeys, Brainstorm, but the U two. I mean, I think every musician or band wishes they started an album like that. Um just so cinematic and engaging i think it's going th- it's going through a bit of a um roller coaster with opinion i'm sure because i bet when it came out it was like considered arrogant or like a bit um self-indulgent or something like that but since but over time oh, i mean i'm 33 so i think it came out the year i was what, what year did it come out 87 uh yes that's my birth year, so I don't really know what I'm talking about in terms of the, how it was react. That's just my take on it, but it's just uh, I thought it's just so engaging. It's just so like rousing and emotional, but epic, and the song delivers as well. After, I mean, I've tried to do that, do the big epic cinematic thing, and we've made it so good that then we can't compete with our intro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, did it, we, we did it kind of recently we did it about two years ago and we just uh, had to delete it yeah um, but I could have given so many more answers for this but I just I tried to be pragmatic and almost uh, practical it's it's really weird Sam You're, I mean I've done 360 of these podcasts and no one's chose that yet and I'm really surprised because it, it's I know it, it's an absolute masterpiece and I'm 49 no I'm 48 um and <laughs> i would have been uh, 14 15 when joshua tree dropped and mm. and i don't remember it being met with that much criticism for it being pompous or overblown or anything like that i think at the time they'd come this is two years after live aid and they'd you know mm. they'd stole the show there and <clears throat> and then they just put together this perfect record i think um yeah. i think the kind for me looking in on it I think the kind of the pomp and the, the 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 kind of people sort of starting to dig at maybe Bono more than the band a bit more kind of come a few years later, I think, with the, you know, with, with some of the latter albums. But for me, I think that was the last record that, that, that you two done where the live shows weren't about lights and, you know, kind of him phoning up Salman Rushdie and and doing all of these crazy things and landing in like big lemons and stuff like that on stage. It was, it was Bono, white vest, pair of jeans, yeah. walking out there. He didn't need anything else because his voice was one of the most incredible things ever. And that intro, mm-hmm. the build up is beautiful. And obviously you just get the best introduction to Edgy's guitar you could ever want to hear. Mm-hmm. But it's when that opening line of Bono's voice, it's just perfect isn't it and it just gathers it speed works. well it makes it makes sense uh now no well they, they dare the right to do it obviously then with that performance at, at live aid so that makes sense why they they got away with it um but yeah it's the to- there's something about the tone of his voice it's just uh so satisfying when it cuts through i, I agree it's probably his it probably is that moment that makes the intro 
so with that and you know over the last sort of you know eight months making another record and and with intros I've spent 360 podcasts trying to frame this question correctly and I'll never quite manage it um but streets have my names are a really good example of something that's really long mm -hmm. and 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 obviously you get the payoff when it when it drops but the way that music's consumed now and the way that algorithms you know and all of that stuff that doesn't seem very um what's the word i'm looking for organic and real all of these things that unfortunately have filtered into the recording industry mm. would i mean I, I don't know if a band went into a, a record company and said oh this is our this is our single right. it's where the streets have no name by mm. the way you won't get a vocal for over a minute but <laughs> i wonder if that would happen now and so um I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. I want to throw no, that out there. Like, uh, okay. A song should be a song. I can give you some hope. It, it wasn't a single of ours, but the album I was mentioning of ours that came out in January 2020 was called Power, and the first song was called Oh Euphoria. And on the vinyl, which is kind of, that's like the full-length album, because we, yeah. we had to cut it down for other things. The vinyl, I think the intro is like two and a half minutes or something like that of just a drum groove just a groove for honestly yeah. two. I, I need to look it up i'm sure it's like over two minutes um i mean i'm, I'm kind of answering your question for you because it wasn't a yeah. single <laughs> but but do you do you are these kind of things considerations for you when you write songs now you know that the fact that algorithms and like how you know you've got three seconds snapchat and all of that stuff that that you know the people that you know, Not TikTok and the way that people are sort of consuming, young people are consuming music now. It does seem very fast paced and attention spans are, are, appear to be yeah. getting tighter. And I just wondered if that ever filters through into your creative process when you're sort of, you know, right, this is going to be a single. Mm -hmm. Do I want to get the chorus in? Do I want to start with the chorus? Do it, how do I, you know, do any of that sort of things find their way into your, your creative brain? Yes, but not because of what's going on. Uh, tech wise or anything that's I've always kind of thought that way um, because the space that we sort of have occupied between because we're a bit of an oddball band like we're not really a radio pop band we're not really a rock band we're not an alternative band or an indie band we're not we're, we're actually we're not we're not even sure what type of band we are but I, because of that I've always just focused on like making sure the songs have got quality as the, as the sort of main sort of, I don't know, stitch between all the records and the songs. And I've kind of tried to like study as best I can on, on my own, at least like the greats and what they do well. Um, and I've always been really conscious of like, I, I think because I felt like an underdog the whole time we've been doing this, especially in the very beginning, because I was just so desperate to, do what we're doing now and to travel and be away from Glasgow and um, just be in music, I was like, you need to grab people's attention instantly. So I kind of always thought that way. Um, and I've even looked at like, I've even, I've, I've always kind of, now I'm sort of in chart, I'm at the helm of the computer and recording a lot of, of uh, stuff. But I, even back in the day, I was like, when does that chorus hit? What is that? Yeah. Because I'd, I mean, I'd heard that if, I, if you can get a chorus to hit I, between 50 seconds and a minute, I think it's like 90% of all number one songs or something like that yeah. do that. Yeah. I was like, well, why would I not fucking do that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> why would I not want to hit that sweet spot knowing yeah. that that is, is there? But don't get me wrong, we've also got like six and a half minute prog rock songs in there and like yeah. five minute long... Um, ambient instrumental songs and things like that in our back catalogue, probably because I've overanalyzed pop structure. Um, a way that we got around recently, like our, our the first single we've got off our new album, um, in the intro, it's just a kind of like, it's a guitar and drum groove. Um, and it, it basically is just going round and round, but I got my mum to like talk over it. 
because that was the way of keep catching people's attention and keeping yeah. them in the song. Um, but yeah, people say that to people. People do go on about it and say, oh, that won't do well at streaming because it's too whatever in the first 30 seconds. Which you, you can't be governed by that, can you? It's like... I promise you that I'm not. I, I do take it in and I'm listening, but I don't think... I'm too, uh, I'm too into the emotional uh, development of a song to yeah. give up that uh, part of it. Because like I was saying in the beginning, that's why I do what I try to do. Um, yeah, uh, it's quite... A de- if you allow yourself to really focus on it, it's quite depressing that that's the way... 100%. 100%. Well, you mentioned emotion. So yep. for track two, Sam, I'm going to ask you to uh, tell me, please, the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional uh, impact on you, please. Yes, sir. Um, Bruce Springsteen's Thunder Road. Okay. I'm probably, like, so I only used to see my dad uh, at the weekends, like on a Sunday, and we would just, we would go like really long drives into the Scot- like the sort of beginning of the Scottish hi- Highlands, um, sort of like Loch Lomond area, and a wee bit further north than that, you get into uh, Glencoe, which, if, if you're not familiar with it, is like basically a road right up the middle of all these epic mountains, and um, they're quite ugly and like really... C- like rock like rock based there's not many plants or anything like that it's like a bit of a barren uh wasteland to drive through but my dad would always this was like mixtape era um because i was probably i mean i'm sure my earliest memory of this is probably somewhere around like seven or eight or something like that um and there would be loads of songs i'm trying to think what the other songs would be it was in that sort of ballpark of Bruce Springsteen and the American sort of song book writers like yeah. Young or but then we'd also listen to like full Whitney Houston records and things like that. Yeah. Um, but this song always stood out. Maybe it was where it was on the mixtape or something like that that he had. I'm not sure why. Or maybe it was the surroundings and I've I've, I've gone on to like study Springsteen pretty in depth, but he was always going on about escapism and cinematic writing. Um, and it just maybe matched what we were doing on these long drives and it just I remember that's the first sort of moment in a song where I was like taking something away from it more than like oh this is fun or this is that sounds cool or that that's funny or like exciting or something it was like it made me feel hopeful or sad even as a kid I remember having that sort of um, getting it I don't know. I mean, it's quite a kind of grown-up song to to get at that age, but I was just probably just quite lucky with the surroundings. Um, what do you think the emotion was, Sam? If you had to pinpoint it, um, well, I'm not sure if that. I mean, it's probably it's that. I mean, the sweet spot between happiness and and sadness is probably like. I don't know, it's like a mixture of hope and nostalgia, like what, being excited about the future, but also kind of sad about the, the past or the present. Um, I'm not sure what that emotion is. But that song, it's the, I mean, it's the chord progression of the song and the, the, me- the, me- the vocal melody, when you mix them together, it just sounds like desperation, but like getting out of it. Do you know what I mean? It's like climbing out or, or um, I'm not sure if I'm skewed now with like my adult brain and my songwriting uh, experience sure. reviewing this now. But I do, but that was, I, I mean, I've got the lyrics tattooed on my wrist, so I do mean what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just remember that song just almost like, I don't know, it was when like it was like when my soul was ignited or something like that with music and then like, uh, then music meaning something else to me. That's where the addiction began, was hearing yeah. that song. <laughs> I'm not really answered you have it. I don't know what the emotion is. I th- I think you nailed that when you said like the sweet spot between happiness and sort of sadness. I think yeah. that's a that's a really nice way to kind of try and 
fathom where your mind was at at such a young age and hearing something that that spiked it and and like you say set your soul on fire it's like i think you know at such a, a young age generally songs just kind of wash over you don't they and i think every now and again if something does spike like that then it really does spike well i mean the song before it was maybe like i don't know whitney houston and i want to dance with somebody and then yeah. the song after it was maybe like Deacon Blue or something like that. Nothing wrong with either. I mean, they're probably in my top 50, top 100 yeah. favourite songs or something, but there was something about this song that just, uh, it was just different. It just sounded more, um, I don't know. I still don't know. Maybe yeah. that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. That's that the I'm, magic. That's yeah, the magic, yeah. mate. <laughs> Staying in the formative years for track three, I'm going to ask you to tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. Yeah, well, it was an easy one to pick, Blink-182, because I think from, like, second year right through to, what you, you know, when I was at college and uni, all I listened to was Blink-182. That was literally all I listened to, uh, probably in quite an obsessive, creepy way, but the song is Anthem Part 2. It's the opening track from an album of theirs, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. And I was in I was in second year at high school and I'd kind of just started getting into like guitar music. Um I've got an older sister, Alana, she's two years older than me, and she was already there. She was listening to like kind of more like skater punk, kind of somewhere between ska and like pop punk music yeah. she was into. Um which I didn't think I, I wasn't that into, but I like that, that that kind of triggered me listening to like guitar bands. And then I met a mate at school. Um, what you used to go into HMV and get CD singles and take the sticker off the CD singles and put them on the albums, take them up to the cash desk and only have to pay like two quid or three quid Sweet. instead of like 21, whatever that record was probably like 22 quid back in the day. Um, so I got a loan of this album from him for, for like two weeks and the opening track in that is like really direct, like a syncopated um, guitar, drum sort of interplay riffing. And I remember just being like, oh my fucking God, what is that? Yeah. Like people, I've heard people talk about hearing Nirvana for the first time and they had that moment with rock music. This, that song was my like... <laughs> slow motion brain exploding yeah. in a mushroom cloud thing where I was like holy fuck <laughs> I, am, am I right in saying that fast forward X amount of years did you play with a, a support blink yeah we did mate it was it, it still doesn't feel real to me um, and even when I replay the memories from it I'm like that just is so surreal and bizarre we, yeah. we actually toured with them twice they had us on two separate UK tours um, they they did a comeback sort of tour after they split up the first time for a few years, and that was like really really hyped, but for obvious reasons because they're they're they've got such a cult following that like because we were the support band we instantly everyone that liked their band liked our band just as a like matter of it used to be like oh who's the blank support band and then you would go and listen to them for like the three months leading up to the tour. Um, so that was a huge, huge leg up for us. But then I'm cutting about backstage with them and they're talking to me and going into like Travis Barker's dressing room. I just couldn't keep my cool. I just couldn't. I was just so, so freaked out and nervous and in awe of them that I just wasn't being myself. They were being totally normal, being like, oh, what are you guys up to? And, oh, you're working with this producer. Or We've met him and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, hey, hey. Yeah, thanks for having us on the tour. Like, just couldn't be myself around them. Um, well, why do you? <clears throat> why do you think that was? Like, you've earned your stripes. You know, you've, you know, you, your band's done what you've done. You, you, you're there, rightly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you, do you ever suffer with, like, imposter syndrome? <laughs> uh, yeah, all the time. I do. I, I mean, like, even just now doing this podcast with you, in the back, there's a, the voice in the back of my head is like, "No one cares, mate. Why are you talking about yourself? Nobody cares." <laughs> um, I'm being truthful there. There's been a couple of moments where I was like, "Right, 
that is a long answer, Sam. Fucking hell, no one is that into what you're saying. Um, I think I don't know. It's maybe just like my. I'm not like a really good musician or anything like that. I'm like, I'm not. Um, uh, that's it's not really why I write songs. I'm not. I don't really care about getting good at guitar or getting really good at singing. Um, so sometimes I get that imposter imposter syndrome feeling because I'm like, at any second I could be found out that I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, but the proof's in the records, man. It doesn't matter know, how know, you get there. Know, or, you I know, know. I, it's hard to argue with that, I know. Because I sound like I'm being overly humble or something to seem like a nice guy. But I genuinely do feel like I'm con every day I'm like, how am I going to prove prove it to people that I'm really yeah. good um, at pulling it all together, I mean, and making making a song. But I think I know why I was like that with that with Blink in particular, because we've toured with loads of other like mega rock stars and I've been in the same, you know, I've met Dave Grohl and chatted away to him about stuff and I wasn't as overawed as I was with them, but I feel like the age, so when when I I started high school in ninety nine two thousand, and second year two thousand two thousand one was like the explosion of like Californian culture on sort of the UK and Europe, um, and the pop punk thing just was like spoon fed to me by radio, but then all the other culture that going on around me at the time was like American Pie movies were coming out. Jackass was on TV, like reruns all night, every night. Um, like Tony Hawk, skateboarder for the PlayStation. Skateboarder. <laughs> Skateboarding was like um, the biggest game. Do you know what I mean? That was like my generation's Grand Theft Auto or whatever. Yeah. And um, so to be in the presence of these guys that were like the talisman for that whole cultural movement it was but it was more of like a it was bigger than because the music wasn't super groundbreaking it was like power chords and like some of the songs were like just about dick jokes and like being at high school and um, it was just a timing thing but these guys were like the epicenter of that to me so i felt like i was in the presence of something really important i think yeah some of their songs were you know about dick jokes and were, you know, straight up punk chords. Nirvana have got these songs that are just straight up punk chords. It's not Radiohead by any means, but Blink and Nirvana, their pop sensibilities are off the fucking scale. They know how to make people react and respond and pull them in. Never mind the greatest pop record ever made, in my opinion. Like every song on that record is so catchy. It's full of hooks, full of like amazing choruses. And Blink literally followed that blueprint. And I think Blink yeah. done exactly the same, just catchy as fuck pop songs, but with just like noisy guitars. And it's like, yeah. that's what a lot of teenagers need. Well, I'll, I'll probably get stuck for, for this, but I'm, it's, just, it's just what I think. Um, that the self-titled Blink record, the one that's the smiley face on the front mm. with the paint dripping down, that to me is as good an album as Nevermind. And I know it's probably not as important. No, I know it's not as important culturally and it didn't have, um, rightly so, the same impact on on music. Um, I'm maybe a bigger Nirvana fan now, by the way, than a Blink fan because I've yeah. worked my way back. Yeah. <laughs> um. But to me, it's like as perfectly crafted. It's the sweet spot between just out and out pop perfection, meeting like artistic freedom of of speech and license. And like some of the stuff they did on that record, like I'm not like a super. Um, I mean, if anything, I'm like anti-war, anti-army person. But there's a speech written and read out on that Blink record by like. Um, a widower whose husband went off to fight in Afghanistan and she's reading out a letter to him if he'd still, do you know I mean? There's things on it that are that are really like creatively um, inspiring, risk-taking things that Nirvana were doing obviously on Nevermind, but three-piece power pop rock records, to me, they're like on a par. Yeah. Okay. Track four. 
first song you were buying <laughs> from a record shop? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, with my own money, that was my decision. Because really, the true answer to this is my dad took me and my sister into a record store and went, you can get any CD you want. Um, and that's, we never and I, we never did that again after it was some, he must have had a rush of blood to his head or something. And I picked uh, Jimmy Nail's uh, first album. Nice. <laughs> I know that's not my answer here, but that wasn't my, that was a panic thing. Yeah. I, just looked at all, it was so, I mean, I don't know what I was doing, but the first thing I went in, I remember going into town, I'm going to get this seed. Uh, well, I got it on tape. Was Craig David's Rewind? It's featuring someone, or he? It's featuring Craig David. It's by someone else. I can't remember the. It's like a garage, a UK garage DJ. Artful Dodger. Artful Dodger. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it's Artful Do- Dodger featuring Craig David, right? Mm. That's. I mean, I don't know. I think I. I, I think. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know if I was trying to impress a girl or something like that, that I knew all the words or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, actually, I remember buying it. And then me and a mate went back to like a girl's house where there was other girls from our year at school. And I just was like so terrified of girls. They were just like so powerful and like much smarter than me and like <laughs> in control of the situation at all times compared to my like nervous a uh, little like probably horny little brain at the time do you know what yeah. I mean and uh, I was like yeah I got, we went into town we went to HMV and we bought these and like I bought this and like remember putting the tape in and playing it and I was all like there's probably like six or seven of us all sitting around in this girl's room like listening to <laughs> listening to it ah, fucking <laughs> no. it's great though right I mean their memories I mean you, you can vividly remember that which is I mean uh, that's what music's about I remember right? taking the tape out of the because <clears throat> it, it was in like a sort of cardboard sleeve and the sleeve was like black and green and I remember being like oh shit they were saying what did you buy and like now it's my time to put this on we just listened to what the record the CDs or whatever they singles they bought that day and like sat around in a group listening to them and I remember being nervous like oh fuck why did I buy this I don't even know if I like this I should have brought. I should have bought like "What's My Age Again," Blink One Eight Two, or something like that. What did I do this for? <laughs> I think I was just trying to be like cool at the time, because that was like um that was before it was like a big. I think it was like the day it came out, so it wouldn't have been number one yet or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a big record, wasn't it? And like you know, yeah. Craig David was a. I mean, that was a song, I guess, that launched him really, and he became a mega star, didn't he? And mega star did, yeah. And has, has had a huge resurgence in, in, in recent times as well. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the first the first record, this is the question where it's perfectly fine to have something that ain't that cool. That's <laughs> what, that, this question was designed for that. <clears throat> I think it's co- it's probably cooler to have shit answers. Like, 100%. You know, or Craig David Rewind. It's not even a... It is, a, it, is a good, it is a good record, but it's a... Uh, I mean, it's got, like, comedy fucking spring sound effects in it and stuff yeah. like that, doesn't it? Have you got glass smashing as well? Aye, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Ross from Friends song when he has... The- <laughs> um, Big explosion at the end. Yeah. But, like, that was when, like, UK Garage was, like, absolute peak. Five of the songs in the top ten were all by different... Do you know what I mean? Um, so I just kind of I do get I do get swept up in like popular culture in general um, so I'm not surprised that I did that now I think about it it makes a lot of sense yeah but that's what I got at the time track five I'm going to ask you please to tell me the song that soundtracked your years clubbing please um, well I don't know how big of a clubbing person I was but this can also be, Sam, this can also be going to your local indie night or yeah, anything like that. It hasn't necessarily got well, to be. I, I did, but, I, but but my next part of that was I did go to loads and loads of club nights because that's just what you do in Glasgow. There's a culture here to... I know that's not unique, but it's just particularly set up that way in Glasgow um, because there's like a history of like 
I guess like almost like snobbery of club music here and like the club night experience is taken really seriously here. Um, but yeah, anyway, the song is by Felix the Housecat. It's called Ready to Wear. Um, do you know that? Do you know that song? Mm. I, I, I do know. Do you know something? There's something. There's like a thread through all the stuff that I'm saying here, but it's it's got that sort of sweet spot between happiness and sadness, nostalgia, hopefulness. It just had the same effect on me as like the Springsteen song or the U2 intro. It's um, I still listen to it. I, I probably listen to that like a handful of times every month just to like retune harmonically what is going on in that song. I want to do that. I still haven't figured it out. Um, yeah. But that's the song that like we would all take really, really serious. Like it was more like when you would go back to somebody's house or flat after a night out, that's what we would play. So it's, I feel like I've got more memories of listening to that at an after party thing than I do. Sure. It's a bit of a come down song, just like the atmosphere of it. Um, oh man, it's perfect. I hope people listen to it or have who people who have heard it or been reminded of it it's quite an old song now um you 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 touched on um you know when, when you're talking about the, buying the craig david single about you know being sort of terrified of of girls at that age and <clears throat> and i, I want to ask you a, a, a two questions here sam and I want to know, you know, in these formative years, was you confident? Uh, well, I'll let you answer that first, and then I'll I'll follow it up. And has your and if you wasn't, where do, you know, is that something you can learn to be more confident? I th- think so. Um, I think I I think I was doing this sort of. Um, like growing up before like adolescence or whatever, even at school, I was always performing, but not in a way that you would think, oh, that guy's going to get into like acting or music or something like that. I was more just like a class clown sort of, like a Robin Williams character that like I can't help but turn something into a joke or be a show off or like... You like the attention? I think so. I probably an attention seeker rather than like... um meriting the attention <laughs> by doing something good uh, or talented or whatever but I think then when I went to high school I went to like a different I went to a different school than all my friends before um, and I think I just had to like be confident do you know what I mean just had to like um, I'm not really answering your question I think yeah you can you can learn how to be more confident but it's um, it's probably something that's always been there. I don't know. Really good question. That might be the that might be the that might be the best question I've ever been asked <laughs> in an interview. I think. Um, can you see my mind like defrag? <laughs> I can hear it, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm like going. I, I think my whole life's flashing in front of my eyes right now. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm like, see when I walk on stage now. That's what I was going to say. You you walk on stage in front of thousands of people. Like that's not, that's not something anyone can do. Do you know what I mean? There's a confidence to that. I know. I know. But you should see the state of me before. You should see what it takes to get to that point. It's like a really long build up all day. I have no idea where it comes from, mate. I have no idea. Because I'm terrified walking on stage. And I'm terrified I'm not now, but I, I was terrified to like approach my wife and like say like I like you or like can I get your number or I just couldn't I don't know I just uh, I don't know if I've all I've you know what maybe I've just spent so many years hiding behind metaphors and artwork because I, I went to art school as well and between the two phases we're talking about me now and me as a, yeah. a kid I went to art school as well and I've always just kind of buried my head into like 
not my head, I've buried probably my my real self behind made up versions of me. Do you know what I mean? Sure, absolutely. Songs and paintings and lyrics, um, stuff that I like to take the attention off of me, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, so but I do think you can learn to be more confident. I do, but the only way I think you do it is by every single day constantly being out of your comfort zone to the point where you just don't have a comfort zone anymore. I think you need to. It needs to, that, that. That's my experience anyway. Confidence aside, then choosing um, initially, I guess, looking at art. You know, to 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 make money in the world of art isn't easy to make a career in music is not easy you know to have achieved the level of success that you've achieved in music is really fucking not easy so confidence aside how driven are you <laughs> um i feel rude not saying like thank you for saying everything you just said there firstly before i like keep talking about myself um, I'm driven to the point of like fucking driving people away from me. Probably it's 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 um it's too much, mate. It is too much. But I, but um I've learned how to park it and let it build and let it build and let it build and let it build. Sometimes for three months at a time, I'm not. Re- I, it seems like, like I'm not maybe doing something, but I'm like deep in thought about how to take something to the next level or how do I beat my best, att- you know, live show or gig or how do I get better at interviews or how do I get, do you know what I mean? How do I like let my guard down and how do I like, I'll, I'll be, th- I'll think about something like that for like three, four months at a time so that. I can make an album in five weeks at home with minimal gear. If you know what I mean, yeah. like the, the the drive is uh, it's unhealthy at times, but um, it's that that's partly why I love being in a band because I'm the guy who's like laser focused, so so driven, um, but then having guys to like fall back on who are more laid back or someone who's more got like their life and or their moral compass is stronger than mine so like having people like that around me to bounce off of um ultimately every band needs one of you in it though yeah i think so i yeah i think so but I've, i've seen a lot of bands um you can be too driven i'm i'm saying i'm so so driven but i'm really focused with it if you know what i mean i'm really I would say that I'm like a pretty solid like people person. I like can read people well, so I know when to like shut up about pestering people for a support slot or something, or how how to make it not all about me. But somehow in the end, it was all about me. <laughs> I'm like I'm like a twisted manipulator. I think. Um, I the, my, my dry, but I think I think it's sparked from like. My, my upbringing was like um, really, really good and amazing and dead, dead happy. But as you get older, you realise like, mm, I don't know, that was probably quite tough and I was just a wee guy, so I didn't know. And I think uh, the things I've seen around me growing up, I've just been like, I, I never want to be back in that situation. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. probably driven, like I don't think I was just born with drive. I think it was some of the stuff I've seen along the way or some of the situations my family have been in have probably made me like um it wasn't even like I lit a fire under me the fire was lit by others and I'm like trying to climb up away from it type of thing yeah um and then I don't know now that has now that is just in built within me so anything that I try and take on I'm a, like our bass player Ross sometimes says to me like, dude, it's too much, you're way, it's relax. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but if you're in a band where everyone just relaxes, then, you know, it, it, I know, I, 
in, in a much smaller scale, I was you in my band. And, mm -hmm. you know, you need, you know, when I look back at it now, 20 years later, we wouldn't have got the deal. We wouldn't have done this. We wouldn't have done that had it not been, and I don't mean this taking anything away from the rest around me being that, guy that's going no, no we need to do this we've got to do that that will help us do that and yeah. I think every band needs that I really do and and I think I would sometimes look at the other guys in the band and just think oh man I wish I was a bit more like you I wish I could just kind mm -hmm. of put my feet up in the, in the mm -hmm. van and just think oh let's just enjoy the ride but I was always thinking of the next thing of how we could then take it to there and what we could do with that and I think that can become all-encompassing like and mm -hmm. and, it, and it can sometimes I think when you take a minute and look at it just go oh man like but I think if you've got that inherent drive and that desire to do the best possible version of what you're doing mm -hmm. then then I think that's that, that's who you are and that's what you should do yeah mate it's just the uh, it's just good old Glaswegian working class roots yeah just my grandparents, my mum and dad, I've just seen them hustle, do you know what I mean? And just work so hard that then given given an opportunity to do, to be on the stage with like my heroes that had posters up on the wall and stuff like that, I'm like, right, I'm grabbing this with two hands Damn and right. running as fast as I can with it. Damn yeah. right. So, yeah, mate. Let's go back to them roots you just mentioned. Track six, favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Um, oh, you, it says home county. So you can I, go. You, you can go country. Three hundred and fifty. Three hundred and sixty guests have all said country. Don't worry. I, oh, need, really? I need to rearrange how I write that in in the email. My home county. Well, I'm 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 a rare breed where I actually am from Glasgow, like from the city of Glasgow, like born in the city, lived in the city, still live in the city, just about. <laughs> I still got a G at the front of my postcode. Um. I'm happy for you to go with country because there's some songs on your list that I'd, I'd like to talk about. Well, I just kind of was rhyming these off without really thinking mm. about it too much. Like Jerry Rafferty, Baker Street. I put Travis, Why Does It Always Rain On Me? But I mean, there's like five or six Travis songs that could be on yeah. list. To be cheeky, I put ACDC, Back in Black. You can have that. You can have that. <laughs> <laughs> like Scotland's like, no, we've got, we've got a world famous rock band. <laughs> um, um, Annie Lennox walking on broken glass. Annie Lennox, why? Deacon Blue, dignity. Right, I mean, so so many I want to pull apart here. Right, so Annie Lennox, first of all, have you ever heard the original of No More I Love Yous? Of uh, no, who, what? Not her version of it. You mean that's a fucking cover, man? Is it? Yeah, and I didn't know this until maybe four or five weeks ago, and it's from this kind of mid eighties kind of sort of synth band right um that ended up touring with the eurythmics and, and were kind of working with um dave stewart as well right um what are they called well i'll look it up after this i'll find out what they're called but it's fucking amazing it's this huge epic kind of synth record that sounds mm -hmm. like sounds like sort of like a big aha sort of slowy like a, it's Got you. huge and yeah, I mean, it's an incredible record, you know, and, and the Annie Lance version is amazing. But, yeah, go check out the original. It was like, when I say Annie Lance, it literally, I just was, I see your email and I was like, man, like, I wonder if he's <laughs> had the original of that because it's literally been my earworm for the last few weeks. And um, Digna, uh, or Deacon Blue, well, I, I kind of, I got sent something the other day and I've got this thing with, I, I work with a, a musician called Scroobius Pip. He's, yeah. uh, he's, he's, he's a, he's a, he's the guy that got me into doing this. Right. And, uh, and we have this thing where we, we sort of message each other. If, uh, if we see a little, I like, if I'm feeling a little bit hungover or a bit jaded, mm -hmm. I quite like to have a little YouTube watch of songs that are going to kind of get me a bit emotional. And I like to kind of, sort of work through it like that. I think, I think I've replaced listening to kind of somber music now. Yeah. I just go on there because when I hear crads, it gives me just a feeling that I've never, that, that I just, it blows my mind when you hear crads singing lyrics, it mm -hmm. fucking destroys me. Um, and so we, we send each other like, Oh man, have you heard this? <clears throat> and he sent me 
Um, well, I sent him Proclaim of Sunshine and Leaf oh, yeah. uh, at Tea in the Park. That'll fucking do it, mate. Yeah, um, yeah. But he then yeah. topped me by sending back Dignity at Tea in the Park a few years ago mm. by Deacon Blue. Oh, man. Ricky don't even sing. He just lets them sing it. Yeah. Oh, fucking hell, I, man. I don't know something about that song, isn't there? It's just like, I've got so many memories attached to that song from my whole life, basically. And it's always the point in a night where everyone's just steaming enough where they're still happy. It can be the song that sort of triggers the point, oh, no, she's crying, what's that? Do you know what I mean? Or he's... Yeah. Why is, why is he shouting at him? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Because it's the it's usually a moment in a night in Scotland where, like, young through to old or, like, no matter, I mean, like, you could have had on, like, top 10 chart music or something like that, and then this song come, comes on and it just pulls everyone together. Uh, it's, it's, I, maybe I'm thinking it's just a cultural thing in Scotland. Maybe it happens with a song. Well, I can, give, I can give you an example, right? So I, I'm, a, I'm a club promoter. That's that's a, kind of what I do as well. Okay. Um, and uh, and I had a club night uh, in, in, in London and maybe six years ago, Edith Bowman came to DJ for me. Oh, cool. uh, and Edith was playing like kind of lots of big sort of indie bangers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And there's like sort of six, seven hundred people jumping around to all the kind of big hits. And then she drops Dignity, and I was thinking, that's a fucking brave move. Like, you're in the middle of Shoreditch, yeah? Like, you I know this song, I'm 48. Complete sense, obviously. That That's like a normal move up here. Within a minute, the place was on fire to it. And it's <laughs> like, ah, oh, it works down south as well. <laughs> like, nice. It's such a huge song. I, I mean, I'm, I'm apart from... Uh, Apart from Back in Black on that list, which was obviously slightly tongue in cheek, all this, all the songs on this list, when I look from bottom to top, not just this and this question, they've got that sort of like happy sad thing going on, um, melancholy, but like joyful melancholy, um, even like Travis, why does it always rain on me? It's just so as like a like fellow Glaswegian of them it's like that just sums up like any other see if that was like a, a, a soul song or something like that or a metal song with that t- there's something about that title being from a Scottish band is just so relatable to me when you listen to it it's a uh, I don't know as, as, a, as a Glaswegian is it inspiring seeing you know bands like Travis you know, go on to 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 do what they've done as as a young lad, sort of seeing these bands become, su- you know, global superstars. You know, do, would you draw from that? Oh, absolutely, yeah, massively. Um, I mean, there's so many Scottish artists. That's why, because I was thinking, like, oh, I will just say like Proclaimers, Five Hundred Miles, because I'm not Scottish unless I say it, unless that's my answer. Sure. And I was like, ah, man. The, um, for such a small country with such a limited route to access to even recording studios, never mind the music industry, like uh, we get so many like massively impactful artists and songs. Um, maybe that's why I've always thought. Maybe that's I don't know. Maybe that's why I take like songwriting really seriously and like the craft of it is dead important to me because I've got like. I could I very easily could have just like uh, just turn out another one of those types of songs and we'll do well and blah, blah blah. But I'm like, nah, I need to evolve and I need to like show growth in songwriting. Um, I don't know. I feel like Scottish people, Scottish songwriters are taken like seriously. I don't know. Maybe they're not. Maybe definitely, sure. definitely. I mean, I, I like I I sat just to do this podcast to initially i was going to do it on certain locations each series on a certain location to 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 understand why there seems to be this desire that if you want to make it in in music you know you've got to move to london and this was this was bred purely out of the fact that i live just outside of london in essex Mm -hmm. um and i would i would chat to uh, the aforementioned scroobius pip at the time was was having a very successful time in music Mm -hmm. and all he would get asked is like oh like do, do you live in london like and he's like, no, I live in Essex. Are you going to move to London? He's like, no, nah. like I, I like where I live. And 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 
I asked that. I had Fran and Dougie from Travis on, and and I think of what other incredible Scottish bands I spoke to. Roddy from Idlewild, who are an incredible band, mm. um, and 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 just about their their love of where they come from and that lack of no, no, no we, we're doing it on our terms where we're at, and you know, you you come to us. Like, you know, there's a rich heritage of music from Glasgow. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I find it, I th and I think that's what creates scenes and and that's what creates kind of movements in music is that, you know, so many times, you know, Manchester gets mentioned on this podcast, you know, that, that kind of 89, 91, Rosie's Mondays in spirals, that kind of movement. That's, that's you know, that's a city's done that. And, and I think... Glasgow's got a wealth of of incredible talent, and I think if that's there in the very fabric of it, to go for sort of full circle, you know, is it, that must be something that you can draw from and go, well, look, you know, we might not have the best studios and you know everything at, at our disposal like maybe they have in London, but seeing everything that's come before me means this is totally fucking doable, right? Well, yeah, aye, massively, massively. I, th I think there's um, there's just something about the fabric of this place that when you leave it behind, like, you really miss it um, to the point of distraction because there's nowhere else really like home, obviously, for everyone out there. But... Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is about Glasgow. It's probably. I mean, like it rains all the time. It is quite a miserable place, but with like the happiest people you meet, and that is obviously a thread through all these songs that I've picked here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's quite a dangerous place, but then it's also probably the one of the first places that someone would step out to like protect you or something. Do you know what I mean? Sure. It's quite a kind of um. I mean, it's quite an it's quite an extreme flip flop between the two, uh, but that I, I don't know whether that breeds creativity or I'm not I'm not sure what it is. But I'm sure it would definitely breed confidence and certainly drive. Well, I think now that I'm thinking a bit clearer, I think what made me that sort of confident uh, in front of people was like working in bars in Glasgow. When I was at art school, I worked in a couple of different bars one called Block and one called Nice and Sleazy's. Nice and Sleazy's is quite a kind of like cultural hotspot here. It's like quite a famous music venue as well. And uh, it was a sink or swim situation because of the customers that were coming in. And like Block had like a punk venue you just set up on the floor, but it was like quite revered amongst like that sort of community. Mm. Nice and Sleazy's was like the extreme snobby indie art school music scene. And if you didn't just immediately like take to, do you know what I mean? How you would talk to people and how, the way you dress or how you conduct yourself or like uh, in, in Glasgow, if somebody was giving you a hard time, if you can't just like own it and deal with it, you couldn't really work in those places. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think I think that was what maybe helped me with um, hecklers and shit like that live or... Yeah the crowd not being on my side or whatever it is to, to have that confidence to kind of win them over. I got schooled, like working yeah. in the bars here. Yeah. Okay, for your final track, you get to play Tastemaker, Sam, and I'm going to ask you, please, to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear, please. Yeah, well, this is a... I, th I think I must have just been on one with this playlist that I've put together. I must have been feeling sad or something, like... Um, where I got to the end of all these songs and this was one that sort of jumped out at me. It's a band from the States called Make Do and Mend. The song's called St Anne. And I mean, I don't know, there's something about it. Every time I hear it, I need to like, right, everyone shut up. I need to turn this up. I need to like really listen to the to this. It kind of comes around, like I'll maybe only listen to it once or twice a year or maybe even once every couple of years. But when I hear it, it's just like, it does a certain thing to me. And I think when other people will hear it for the first time, the same it will have the same effect. It's just so desperately sad, but like, um, it's like a hard-hitting rock song. 
but it's it's in the sort of ballad territory, I, I would say. But the guy's vocal, I think, I think they're from Boston. I think, I can't remember. I'm, 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 they're def- or I'm not even sure they're East Coast now that I'm saying that. But the but Twin Atlantic, we played in uh, 2012. We did the Warp Tour in the States. And we don't really fit into that scene. Do you know what I mean? We, we've yeah. got one foot in that world because we've got melodic um, kind of power pop stuff happening, big rock moments. But we don't really fit into that scene. And um, all the other bands on the tour, to me, bar maybe four or five, I was like, this is fucking awful. I hate this. And I hate how they're treating their fans. And I hate how it's all about, like, merch and, like, how many piercings and tattoos and shit you've got and I, I've got tattoos and that I'm not slagging it but it was more like the image of the whole thing and this band because your time slot changes every day on Warped Tour you could be playing at 11 in the morning and then 4 in the afternoon and blah, 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 whatever you are and I just like heard this song live and I was like what the f- that is that is a piece of me that is like completely different to everything else on this tour and then I ended up like I just had just revisit it to get that feeling again. Um, the guy's got like a really rough, gravelly voice singing this really like sweet, emotional song. I don't know. It's just a really good example of sad but happy, hopeful nostalgia. <laughs> well, Sam, we put uh, together a, a Spotify playlist to accompany the podcast, so people can go and listen to they listen to that track and all the other tracks that we've we've, we've spoken about today. What a crazy, crazy playlist this is going to be. Um, uh, yeah, if somebody's just getting stuck into the rock stuff and then all of a sudden Rewind's going to drop as well with some smashed glass and explosions, brilliant. Um, but just to sort of start to wrap things up, as 2021 is, you know, he's, he's, he's starting to kind of come to a, come to a close uh, and, and a more connected and happier close it will be uh, than, than 2020. What are you looking forward to from the rest of this year? Um, personally, and what's going to be happening professionally? Um, well, personally, I've just the the room that I'm in. I've just fi- I've just finished. I converted my garage into a studio, so I'm going to be just uh, living in here basically till Christmas, uh, yeah. working away. So I've start out like and wow. Well, personally, I was about that was going to be professional. There's a crossover, isn't there? Just be, there just, always is. There always is. See, because of the pandemic, it's the longest I've ever spent in Glasgow as an like in my adult life. Basically, since I was like eighteen, because we started touring when I was like nineteen, and there were some years we did like over two hundred gigs a year and stuff like that. I was just never here. Um, so I've kind of like fallen back in love with all the things like going to the football, like stuff I just didn't really get a chance to do. Um make like properly having like knowing what the rest of my family are doing with their week so I can like be more a part of all that and then uh professionally I mean yeah being in here I mean we've got an album coming out in January here's the big plug will I go into professional plugging mode do it do it our new album Transparency is coming out on the 7th of January you can pre-order it now (laughs) You should get a voiceover work, mate. Yes, mate. So, <laughs> I'll, obviously, I'll be talking about that loads in the next few months and doing videos and, yeah. Excellent. Sam, it's been an absolute joy talking records with you, man. It's been Likewise. delightful. Thank you. Thank you for the best question I've ever been asked that caused me to nearly unravel my <laughs> in front of your very eyes and ears. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thanks, man. Nice one, mate. Cool. Right, let me just press stop on there.